Good morning. Glad to see you today. We continue our study of the screw tape letters by C.S. Lewis. We've uh, covered most of the letters up to this point. Today we will cover, we will study, we will read the last three letters, letter 29, letter 30, and letter 31. It's a little bit of a review. If you remember, the letters are from screw tape to wormwood. The focus of the letters are to how wormwood can attack the patient, his first human being that he's been assigned to to tempt, so how that he can attack this patient and win his soul for the devil. They've been through various techniques and methods and strategies, and now we're in the latter phases of the letters, and so let's go ahead and read what's happening now. My dear Wormwood, now it is now that it is certain the German humans will bombard your patient's town and that his duties will keep him in the thick of dangers, we must consider our policy. Are we to aim at cowardice or at courage with consequent pride or at hatred of the Germans? Well, I'm afraid it's no good trying to make him brave. Our research has not yet discovered, though success is hourly expected, how to produce any virtue. This is a serious handicap. To be greatly and effectively wicked, a man needs some virtue. What would Attila have been without his courage? Or Shylock without self-denial as regards the flesh? But as we cannot supply these qualities ourselves, we can only use them as supplied by the enemy. And this means leaving him a kind of foothold in those men whom otherwise we have made most securely our own. A very unsatisfactory arrangement, but I trust we shall one day learn to do better. He continues, hatred we can manage. The tension of human nerves during noise, danger, and fatigue makes them prone to any violent emotion, and it is only a question of guiding this susceptibility into the right channels. If conscience resists, muddle him. Let him say that he feels hatred not of it on his own behalf, but of that of children and women, and that a Christian is told to forgive his own, not other people's enemies. In other words, let him consider himself sufficiently identified with the women and children to feel hatred on their behalf, but not sufficiently identified to regard their enemies as his own and therefore proper objects of forgiveness. Let's stop there a minute. You gotta remember that screw tape is a liar. Screw tape is a fiend. Screw tape is a demon. And so he takes whatever he can and changes it, warps it into his purpose. Now we know that in the Bible, Jesus tells us to do what with respect to our enemies? Well, he tells us to love them. This is very difficult. This is one of the most difficult um, commands that we have. But in this, this letter, screw tape is telling Wormwood, uh, a, Christian, a Christian is told to forgive his own, not other people's enemies. Well, we know that's a lie. So it's another instance of we have to use our judgment here in reading uh, the screw tape letters. But the best part comes next where he says, but hatred is best combined, combined with fear. Cowardness alone, alo cowardness alone of all the vices is purely painful, horrible to anticipate, horrible to feel, horrible to remember. Hatred has its pleasures. It is therefore often the compensation by which a frightened man reimburses himself for the misery of fear. The more he fears, the more he will hate. And hatred is also a great anodyne for shame. To make a deep wound in his charity, you should therefore defeat his courage. This is a great truth in that fear guides us really in several ways, but the devil wants fear to guide us to hate. And he says that directly here. Uh, on the other hand, 
in God's world, in God's universe, fear guides us to courage. Fear guides us to do what is right, what is honorable, what is just, as opposed to generating hate in us and driving our behavior towards eliminating whatever the object of our hate is. So we see this this advice from, from screw tape to wormwood, concentrate on his fear, and then see if you can drive that fear to hate. Now, it could be hate of the Germans in this case because they're bombing uh, England and that would be an easy target, but that's really not the purpose. Uh, What does hate do to a person? Well, it doesn't uh, build them up, it really tears them down and it really destroys their soul. And that really is what um, screw tape is all about, destroying the man's soul. Uh, He continues on. In peace, we can make many of them ignore good and evil entirely. In danger, the issue is forced upon them in a guise to which evil we cannot blind them. There is here a cruel dilemma before us. If we promoted justice and charity among men, we should be playing directly into the enemy's hands. But if we guide them in the opposite behavior, this sooner or later produces, for he permits it to produce, a war or revolution. And the undisguisable issue of cowardness or courage awakes thousands of men from moral stupor. As to the actual technique of temptations to cowardice, not much needs to be said. The main point is that precautions have a tendency to increase fear. Superstitions, if not recognized as such, can be awakened. The point is to keep him feeling that he has something other than the enemy and courage the enemy supplies to fall back on, so that what was intended to be a total commitment to duty becomes honeycombed all through with little unconscious reservations. For remember, the act of cowardice is all that matters. The emotion of fear in itself is no sin. And though we enjoy it, it does us no good. So we live in a dangerous world, so to speak, and that creates fear in us. Fear, the emotion of fear can drive us to certain behaviors. The devil wants fear to drive us to hate which is not what God wants the fear to drive us. It, he wants us to, it to drive us towards courage, to standing up. So again, we finish letter 29 on that last sentence. For remember, the act of cowardice is all that matters. The emotion of fear is, itself is no sin. Though we enjoy it, it does us no good. This takes us to the next to last letter, Letter 30. I sometimes wonder whether you think you've been sent into the world for your own amusement. I gather not from your miserable and inadequate report, but from that of the infernal police, that the patient's behavior during the first air raid has been the worst possible. He's been very frightened and thinks himself a great coward and therefore feels no pride. But he has done everything his duty demanded and perhaps a bit more. So in this case, the patient has performed admirably in the face of the bombs. He goes on to admonish Wormwood about his failures, but then he says, the only constructive passage in your letter is where you say that you still expect good results from the patient's fatigue. That's well enough but it won't fall into your hands. Fatigue can produce extreme gentleness and quiet of mind and even something like vision. If you had seen men led by it into anger, malice and impatience, that is because those men have had efficient tempters. The paradoxical thing is that moderate fatigue is better soil for peevishness than absolute exhaustion. 
To produce the best results from the patient's fatigue, therefore, you must feed him with false hope. So again, what he's saying here is, okay, we've got another opportunity, and this opportunity revolves around fatigue. But you have to be careful here because fatigue can also produce virtues. And so uh, you've got to use it to your own benefit. And the way to do that is to get fatigue to uh, give him false hope that the bombing will end soon, that the war will end soon, that so on and so on will end. When it doesn't, he becomes even more frustrated, even more depressed. He goes on, I do not know whether he is likely to meet the girl under conditions of strain or not. If he does, make full use of the fact that up to a certain point, fatigue makes women talk more and men talk less. Much secret resentment, even between lovers, can be raised from this. Now, this is kind of funny because at, I believe at this point in time, C.S. Lewis is a bachelor. And he's quite a, got quite a few opinions on men and women and how they behave. <laughs> So uh, this is another one of his little ditties about the difference in men and women, which I'm not sure is true, but it's his perspective at least. Uh, so uh, really the last piece of this letter is probably the most important one because in this, in this reading, in this last several passages, he talks about faith and attacking the man's faith. Probably the scenes he is now witnessing will not provide material for an intellectual attack, attack on his face. Your previous failures have put that out of the, your power. But there is a sort of attack on the emotions which sh still can be tried. It turns on making him feel, when first he sees human remains plastered on a wall, that th this is what the world is really like, and that all religion has been a f fantasy. You will notice that we have got them completely fogged about the meaning of the word real. They tell each other of some great spiritual experience. All that really happened was that you heard some music in a lighted building. Here, real means the bare physical facts, separated from the other elements in the experience they actually had. On the other hand, they will also say, it's all very well discussing that high dive as you sit here in the armchair but wait till you get up there and see what it's really like. Here, real is being used in the opposite sense to mean not the physical facts, but the emotional effects those facts will have on a human consciousness. Either application of the word could be defended, but our business is to keep the two going at once so that the emotional value of the word is real can be placed now on one side of the account and now on the other, it happened as it happens to suit us. So again, he's going to say, uh, better only the physical facts are real while the spiritual elements are subjective. Now this is a, a point to be made here is that we think of our spiritual life as something less than real. And that's from the devil. Again, the devil wants to separate things. He wants to divide. In fact, he wants especially to divide our thinking. And as you know, our spiritual life is based on the foundation of faith. We can't see God. And those of us who are here in 2021, we didn't see Jesus either. We believe that he was here. We have written record of it and we know through our life and following him that there seems to be a real uh, result in our belief. And we know that the church, we're, we're told, is the body of Christ. But again, what the devil wants us to think is, my job is real, uh, my television watching, that's real. Uh, I'm going to a ball game, I know that's real. But church is kind of, uh, it's not really real, okay? Uh, my spiritual life, prayers, that's not really real. So on and so on. And so if we start down that path, 
we end up at a place where we question our faith. And rather than becoming more mature in our faith, we become less mature in our faith. Now we turn to the last chapter, chapter 31, the denouement of the book. So we're going to spend a little more time on this chapter. He starts off the last chapter. My dear, my very dear Wormwood, my poppet, my pixney, how mistakenly, now that all is lost, you come whimpering to ask me whether the terms of affection in which I address you meant nothing from the beginning. Far from it. Rest assured, my love for you and your love for me are as like as two peas. I've always desired you as you pitiful fool desired me. The difference is that I am the stronger. I think they will give you to me now, or at least a bit of you. Love you. Why? Yes, as a dainty morsel as ever I've grown fat on. Now you're gonna see here, <laughs> this is a picture that C.S. Lewis is, is, is uh, drawing here of the demons. Uh, and, he, and he does it even more in a, uh, in a band, he has a, uh, later he has a, uh, Screwtape proposes a, a toast, which he published in, in the early, uh, the late 50s, 1959, I believe, in the Saturday Evening Post, where it was a banquet. And it was a banquet of demons. Uh, and they were, it was like a graduation ceremony for the young tempters. And the food was the souls of the, the souls of humans. And so what we see here is when he talks about eating, uh, eating wormwood, actually, he says, as dainty a morsel as ever I've grown fat on. And this is his nephew now. So there's really no love lost at all. There is no love. Remember, demons don't understand love. They think it's a big trick. He continues, you have let a soul slip through your fingers. <clears throat> How well I know what happened at the instant when they snatched him from you. There was a sudden clearing of his eyes, was there not? As he saw you for the first time and recognized the part you had in him and knew that you had it no longer. Just think and let it be the beginning of your agony. What he felt at that moment as if a scab had fallen from his old sore, as if he were emerging from a hideous shell-like tether, as if he shuffled off for good, and all a defiled, wet, clinging garment. By hell, it is misery enough to see them in their mortal days taking off dirtied and uncomfortable clothes, and splashing in hot water and giving little grunts of pleasure, stretching their eased limbs. What then of this final stripping, this complete cleansing, the more one thinks about it, the worse it becomes. He got through so easily. No gradual misgivings. No doctor's sentence. No nursing home. No operating theater. No false hope of life. Sheer instantaneous liberation. One moment it seemed to be all our world. The screams of bombs, the fall of houses, the stink and taste of high explosive on the lips and in the lungs the feet burning with weariness, the heart gone like a bad, the heart cold with horrors, the brain reeling, the legs aching. Next moment, all this was gone, gone like a dream, never again to be of any account. Defeated, outmaneuvered fool. Now, this is a glorious victory for, for God. The patient is now in his presence. The patient is now in heaven. And for screw, screw tape and wormwood, this is, this is a horrendous defeat. He continues, as he saw you, he also saw them. I know how it was. You reeled back, dizzy and blinded, <clears throat> more hurt by them than he had ever been by bombs. The degradation of it, that this thing of earth and slime could stand upright and converse with spirits before you, before whom you, a spirit, could only cower. Perhaps you had hoped that the awe and strangeness of it would dash his joy, but that is the cursed thing. The gods are strange to mortal eyes, and yet they are not strange. 
He had no faintest conception till he saw them he, that he knew he had always known them and realized what part each one of them had played at many an hour in his life when he had supposed himself alone, so that now he could say to them one by one, so it was you all the time. Recognition made him free of their company almost before the limbs of his corpse became quiet. Only you were left outside. He saw not only them, he saw him, this animal, this thing begotten in a bed could look on him. What is blinding, suffocating fire to you is now cool light to him, is clarity itself, and wears the form of a man. Next to the curse of useless tempters like yourself, the greatest curse upon us is the failure of our intelligence department. If only we could find out what he is really up to. Alas, alas, that knowledge in itself so hateful and mawkish a thing should yet be necessary for power. Sometimes I am almost in despair. All that sustains me is the conviction that our realism, our rejection in the face of all temptation, of all silly nonsense and claptrap, must win in the end. Meanwhile, I have you to settle with. Most truly do I sign myself. You're increasingly and ravishingly as affectionate Uncle Screwtape. So we end the letters on this note. After much temptation, after much trial, the patient, the young man, is killed in war. He's killed during a bombing episode. We don't know if it was in London or where it was, but he instantly dies. He goes to heaven. He sees God, he sees Jesus, he sees the angels around. And at that moment, Screwtape is very disappointed, especially he's disappointed in his nephew, Wormwood. So let's, let's review what we've done over the last few lessons. So why was this book so popular in England when it came out? Why were the magazine articles so popular? Published 31 of these articles, letters. Well, first of all, the story ends with triumph. The story ends with, it's a good ending. Even though the, the young man dies, the devil did not win his soul. So it's a triumph. The other thing is, he's an ordinary man. He's like you and me. He's not, a, he's not special. He's not, you know, there's nothing really that special about him. So as you can imagine, for his readers, this was an encouraging series of letters. Now, if you read this one letter by one letter, it's, it can be discouraging. But if you read the whole uh, catalog of letters, all 31 of them, you see it starts with screw tape advising Wormwood about different strategies to approach and to win the soul of the young man. At the end, you see the desolation and, and, and uh, the disappointment of screw tape in losing the soul and the victory in Jesus, so to speak. So, that kind of ends our lesson for today, and this is the, the last of our lessons on the screw tape letters. Again, I would encourage you to read this book. It's very, uh, you can do it and you could probably do it in one setting. That would probably be pretty difficult, but you can read one letter a day or a couple of letters a day. We've, we've gone through three letters a day, which is not that onerous. But again, I would encourage you to get the book, The Screw Tape Letters, and read it. And the purpose of this book is to reveal the spiritual warfare that goes on all around us and in our life and the tempters that are out there. It also helps us realize what is true and what is false. And there's a lot of falsehood being proposed these days. So again, stay true to what you know to be true. Stay true to Jesus and to God and what he's taught us. 
Hope you have a blessed day. Goodbye.